Well, good morning. I don't think I have a mic working. Awesome. There we go. Well, good morning, Check. friends. We'd like to welcome you to our service this beautiful Sunday morning of September 19th, 2021. I think... Uh, Don and I were just visiting this morning how fast the year is tumbling past. We were just in August and we're two-thirds of the way through September. <laughs> so the days are going quick. The days are going quick. Pat, you want to lead us in worship? Shall we open in worship? Please rise and join us as we sing, Unto Thee, O Lord. Unto Thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto Thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my soul unto thee, O Lord? Do I lift up my soul, O my God? I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let all my enemies triumph over me. Let's do that again. Unto thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my soul unto Thee, O Lord? Do I lift up my soul, O my God? I trust in Thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Let me not be ashamed. Let all my enemies triumph over me. That's a good thought. Don't let them triumph. You know you've got it in you because you've got God behind you. Behind you, amen. In fact, that's where I go when I need somewhere just to, like a chick, a chick under its mother's arm. You need a hiding place. Announcements this morning. I'm glad everybody's here. That's one announcement. <laughs> Men's Bible study will be a Thursday evening at 7 p.m. Pray for Pastor Joy and our ladies as they're coming home today from women's retreat. And also a word of uh, encouragement, read Hosea chapters 4 through 10 for Pastor Roy's next week, Spiritual Adultery. We all enjoy our church fellowship and trees downstairs. Please remember to put some money in the lockbox on the counter there in the kitchen. It helps buy supplies. So just a dollar or so, whatever, whatever you have, change. All right, thank you, Gib, for those announcements. I do want to give you a little bit of a, a COVID-19 update as well. You know, the CDC and um, Boise and the surrounding areas are, are moving into 
a crisis mode of care with regards to health care uh, regarding COVID-19. So just know that we at the church here are continuing to follow COVID-19 protocols and trying to be careful and, and, and keep everybody safe. So that's, a, that's our mission and our goal is to make sure that we can all continue to encourage one another and minister together and worship together, but at the same time making sure that we're following those COVID-19 protocols. All right. Also, I just want to remind you that um, coming up in October is the Pastors Advance um, Conference, which is a pastor's conference for Northwest Yearly Meeting. Pastor Joy and I will be gone the 11th through the 14th. It's during the week, so you won't have to worry about us missing a Sunday. <laughs> so we're grateful to be able to um, be ministered to as pastors and to be encouraged and to be uplifted through the yearly meeting and through our surrounding churches uh, to be able to continue the ministry that we do. So we're grateful for that. As far as um, updates on prayer requests, we want to give praise that Carol's son, Rick, is cancer-free. Hallelujah. Amen. We prayed for healing, and it happened, and we're grateful for that. Uh, Vicki requested prayer for her cousin, who is in the hospital with serious problems, blockage, dialysis, etc. cetera. Uh, Vicki's not here for us to get an update, but we'll continue that prayer for her family as well. And prayers for Betty and her family as they leave Tuesday for a family reunion and for Gib and Donna as they fly out on Saturday to visit the kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids. We're excited for Gib and Donna to make that trip. So we just uh, wish traveling mercies upon everybody as well. And we want to pray for our nation. We want to pray for a revival, for a movement of the Spirit across our land. You know, we see the things going on with the pandemic. We see the things going on with fires and all these natural disasters and all these things and, and you, you can't help but wonder you can't help but wonder what God has at hand for us as a nation and so we just continue to pray for our nation for our leaders and for each one of us as members in that community are there any other prayers or announcements that need to be made at this time Carol okay Okay. All right. Carol's asking for prayer for Mac. He's having problems with his left hip. Is that correct? Hip. His hip. Yeah. Yep. He's having problems with his hip. And so he's supposed to see an orthopedic specialist next week. He's having a hard time getting around, even getting in and out of the car. So if we could lift him up in prayer and ask for healing for that, for Mac and for Carol. All right. As she walks beside him. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your love for us. We are so grateful that still today... As your people, we get to gather in the presence of your spirit and in each other's company to experience your love, your grace, your mercy, your encouragement. What the family of God brings together, Father, we are the hands and feet of you and of your love for each other. And so help us to do that and to do that well. Father, we lift up our nation to you and all the things going on, and we lift up all the prayer requests for traveling mercies and for healing and for all the things that we've talked about this morning and even the things that we haven't talked about, the things that weigh heavy on our heart. We want to thank you for the celebration of Homer's life yesterday and how well it was attended. And we just thank you for taking him home to you and that we get to just be blessed and honored and glorified and to live in the remembrance of his wonderful, wonderful life and his love, a great example of your love. Father, as we continue to worship in your name, we just ask that you anoint us with the presence of your spirit. Continue to give us wisdom, guidance, and strength. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I do have something I would like to say. Carrie, it's nice to see you here. As someone who practically grew up in this church, Carrie Humans, I didn't even know you were in town, so thanks for coming, and it's good to see you. Please rise. We're going to stand on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let his praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises that cannot fail 
When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord. Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all and all Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Amen. We'll continue with you are the rock. You are the rock of my salvation. You're where I go and everything else crumbles. You are the rock of my salvation. You are the strength of my life. You are my hope and my inspiration Lord unto you will I cry I believe in you believe in you for your faithful love to me you have been my help in time of need Lord unto you will I cleave you are the rock of my salvation you are the strength of my life you are my hope and my inspiration Lord unto you will I cry I believe in you believe in you for your faithful love to me you have been my help in time of need Lord unto you will I cleave you are the rock of my soul you are the strength of my life. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> well, if you caught me waving in the middle of a song, it's because my granddaughter is in the balcony and she's waving at me like this. What a blessing. Amen. Amen. You know, my father-in-law says all the time, he says, there's only one thing worse than hearing kids in church. It's not hearing kids in church. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So we're grateful to have Nala here with us today. And T-Man's hanging out with her and Antonio's hanging out with her. Yeah, got a whole crowd up there. And Kelly gets to have her in Sunday school. It's a good day. It's a good day. Well, friends... I want to thank you for joining us this morning. Whether you're here in person or online, we're just grateful that you're a part of our service today and for what God has for us today. Would you please turn in your Bibles to the book of Hosea? We are continuing in our series in the Minor Prophets. And as you know, Minor Prophets does not mean they're minor just because they're irrelevant or small or anything like that. They just happen to be smaller books of the Bible is all. That does not mean their message is any less relevant or any less important than what we would call the major prophets, right? So if you'll turn your Bibles to the book of Hosea in the Old Testament. It's a small book. It's only 14 chapters. And if you're having a hard time finding it, just find the front of the book of Daniel. Go to the right 12 chapters, and you'll be at Hosea. 
So as you're getting to that area in your scripture, I want to share a story with you. <clears throat> On January 29th in 1930, Harold Vivian went to work as the chief control operator at the Columbia Broadcasting Station in New York City. Next slide. Thank you. <laughs> so he went to work as the chief control operator at the Columbia Broadcasting Station in New York City. That day, the station was going to broadcast a speech that was given by King George V to 59 other stations in the United States and Canada. <clears throat> it was for the opening of the Naval Conference in London. It seemed like an ordinary day until just moments before the speech began, someone tripped over the main radio broadcast lines and broke the connection. Harold Vivian, being an intelligent engineer, grasped both ends of the wire, and King George V's speech traveled through Harold's body to the nations. And it's in that context that I believe a prophet is used. So when we talk about prophets and how they're actually being used, this story reminds me of that. Just like that radio signal traveled through Harold's body, God's word travels through the prophets to his people. This is what the prophet is all about. A prophet hears from God, and a prophet speaks for God. Like a spiritual radio. I want one. A prophet receives a transmission from God and retransmits it to others. That's the role of a prophet. We have heard over the last several weeks from Obadiah, Joel, Jonah, and Amos. As we continue in the series of the minor prophets, we're going to hear from several more. But of all those called to be prophets whether minor or major, including Jeremiah and Ezekiel, who I believe had a pretty hard time of it, the one prophet that I would not want to be is Hosea. Hosea was told by God to demonstrate God's love for his people in the worst possible situation. You see, God asked Hosea to marry a wife who would go out on him and have affairs with other men, becoming a prostitute. As if that wasn't enough, God would then ask him to take her back in again. Forgive her, support her, and even help her raise her children. God was demonstrating his love through Hosea, through the worst possible circumstances when you have an unfaithful spouse. Now, I'm not going to assume that we all know what that feels like. But many of us, if not all of us, have experienced or seen the pain, the long-suffering, and the anguish that adultery brings to a marriage that adultery brings to a family, that adultery can bring to a community, and all the hardships that come with it. Over the next four weeks, we're going to journey with Hosea as God uses him to demonstrate his love in a most uncommon way. Today, we will start this journey in the first three chapters. I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to read the book of Hosea each week and become very familiar with the text. It's a hard book. It's very direct. There are some real hard things in the book of Hosea. The book of Hosea is a heartfelt message by a heartsick prophet about a heartbroken God. 
Hosea is the prophet of the last hour. The northern kingdom of Israel is just months away from destruction, from captivity by the Assyrians. Hosea's message is primarily for the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten, tribe, the ten tribes that Pastor Joy referred to as Ephraim. Later, he prophesies about Judah, the two southern tribes. But today, we begin in Hosea 1. So let's read that together. I'll pull out my handy mobile Bible that goes with me everywhere. Anybody else have one? So whether you're using a physical Bible, a digital Bible, or you're at home at your computer, pull up Hosea. Chapter 1. And we're going to read that first chapter first, and then we'll step into each of the other chapters in sequence. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the reign of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblian, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day, I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lo Rahama, which means not loved. For I will no longer show love to Israel, that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah, and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses or horsemen, but I, the Lord their God, will save them. After she had weaned Lo Rahama, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo Ami, which means not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together. They will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. In verse 1, we discover through the timeline of the kings and rulers in both Israel and Judah, the time of Hosea's ministry. His ministry reign was about 50 years. In verse 2, God calls Hosea to take a wife, but not just any wife, a promiscuous wife who will be unfaithful just as Israel has been unfaithful to God. And he commands him to have children with her. So he married Gomer. I don't know about you, I always think of Gomer Pyle. It's, I, I, don't, I don't know if just marrying Gomer was the curse itself, you know? <laughs> well, golly! <laughs> but he married Gomer, and she conceived him a son. So in the first three verses we see that Hosea is in for a long journey. We know the approximate length of his ministry, and right out of the gate, he is called into the most difficult of circumstances. But he's obedient. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, it would be pretty hard to want to go ask a promiscuous woman to be my wife, knowing that she would be unfaithful. That would be hard. 
I don't know that I can honestly say that I could be obedient to that. Today, right now, who I am. But maybe so. By God's strength and not my own, maybe. In the next few verses, in verses 4 through 9, this relationship produces children. And the Lord is continually foretelling the coming judgment of Israel through the naming of Hosea and Gomer's children. Verse 4, the Lord tells Hosea, Call him Jezreel because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. And I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. You know, the word Jezreel means God sows or God scatters. And so what the foretelling here is, is he, as he plays that on, on those word plays that he does using the word of Jezreel, he's talking about the destruction of the nation of Israel and scattering the nation. In 722 BC, the Assyrians will conquer them. And one of the things that the Assyrians do when they conquer nations is they don't only come in and occupy the space, they actually dislocate the people. They scatter them. They scatter them into other countries and other nations and other cities so that they can help them lose their national identity. So they forget, they intermarry, and they lose track of who they originally are. And that was their plan. That's what the Assyrians do, is they come in and conquer and scatter a nation. And so what God is telling Hosea and telling Hosea's people and telling God's people is that I'm going to scatter and destroy the nation of Israel. And then in verse 6, Hosea and Gomer have a daughter. And the Lord said to Hosea, call her lo Rahama, which means not loved. Now, I want to tell you real quick, the lo Rahama and lo Ami, that lo beforehand is the not or the no. It's the negative connotation in the language that says, no, not loved, not my people, right? So if you were to take that lo off, it would be just the opposite. It would be the positive of that. It would be my people and loved, okay? So when the Lord said to Hosea, call her lo Ruhama, which means not love, for I will no longer show love to Israel that I should at all forgive them. In the very next verse, verse 7, is where he affirms the two southern tribes of Judah. Remember I told you he was going to talk about Judah for a second? He's gonna, he affirms the two southern tribes of Judah. He says then, he says he will save them. And he does for another 136 years. The southern tribes of Judah, after the Assyrians conquer Israel, the southern tribes of Judah survive another 136 years before they're conquered by the Babylonians. So when God said he was going to scatter the nation of Israel, he did. And he was going to spare and save Judah. For 136 years, Judah continued on before they were conquered by the Babylonians and not the Assyrians. So that's that living out of God's prophecy. So he's prophesying it here, and that's how it's lived out. And then in verse 8 and 9, Lo Ruhama is just weaned, and they have another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo Ami, which means not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. I want to stop right here for a moment and reflect on how God is feeling towards his people. Are you seeing that? You're not my people. You're not loved. I'm going to scatter the nation of Israel. I think God's saying, I'm done. I'm washing my hands. I'm going to let you be conquered by the Assyrians and I'm going to take care of Judah down here, the two little tribes down in the south. And I want to paint a picture for you. 
God is using Hosea, the prophet, to depict the relationship that he has with the nation of Israel. God has invited Hosea to play the part of God and Gomer to play the part of Israel. In this pageantry, in this play, to depict God's long-suffering. See, God's done so many things for the nation of Israel, trying to bring them back to him and to restore them and to redeem them and everything, and still they continue to turn their back on him. But guess what? There's still hope. There is still hope. Because in verses 10 and 11, even though God is pronouncing the punishment, the coming punishment on Israel, in verses 10 and 11, there's hope. It says, the number of the nations of Israel will not be able to be counted. So right in the last two verses of this chapter 1, where God says, I want to paint a picture of you for you of Israel's adultery, Israel's relationship with me through this life of Homer and Gomer, Hosea and Gomer. But in the end of that, there's this hope. There's this twig that says, but still Israel is going to be so big, so great, greater than the sands, and you won't even be able to count them. And that's going to lead us into chapter 2. So let's go to chapter 2. And chapter 2 starts with the very first verse. Say of your brothers, my people, and of your sisters, my loved one. Rebuke your mother, rebuke her, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Let her remove the adulterous look from her face and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts. Otherwise, I will strip her naked and make her as bare as on the day she was born. I will make her like a desert, turn her into a parched land, and slay her with thirst. I will not show my love to her children because they are the children of adultery. Her mother has been unfaithful and has conceived them in disgrace. She said, I will go after my lovers who give me food and my water, my wool and my linen my olive oil, and my drink. Therefore, I will block her path with thorn bushes. I will wall her in so that she cannot find her way. She will chase after her lovers, but not catch them. She will look for them, but not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my husband as at first, for then I was better off than now. She has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain, the new wine and oil, who lavished on her the silver and gold, which she used for Baal. Therefore, I will take away my grain when it ripens, and my new wine when it's ready. I will take back my wool and my linen, intended to cover her naked body. So now I will expose her lewdness before the eyes of her lovers. No one will take her out of my hands. I will stop all her celebrations, her yearly festivals, her new moons, her Sabbath days, all her appointed festivals. I will ruin her vines and her fig trees, which she said were her pay from her lovers. I will make them a thicket, and wild animals will devour them. I will punish her for the days she burned incense to the bales. She decked herself with rings and jewelry and went after her lovers, but she forgot declares, but me she forgot, declares the Lord. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back, back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and will no longer call me my master. I will remove the names of the Baals from her lips. No longer will their names be invoked. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, 
the birds of the sky, and the creature that move along the ground. Bow and sword and battle will abolish from the land, so that all may lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. In that day, I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies, and they will respond to the earth. And the earth will respond to the grain, and the new wine, and the olive oil, and they will respond to Jezreel. I will plant for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called not my loved one. I will say to those not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. Now that's a lot to take in. But in verse 1, the negative, the low that we talked about, that preceded Rahama and Loami in chapter 1 is dropped. And it signifies that God is going to change their status. He's going to take away the negative condition of their status and make it positive. Do you know that's what he does for us? He takes away the negative condition of our status and restores us and redeems us into a positive one again. Sin is our negative condition. And God wants to remove that and redeem us to himself. Now, through the rest of the chapter, too, we're taken through a woven tapestry of abandonment. God abandoning his people in the short term to God restoring them in the long term. In verses 2 through 13, represent the movement of abandonment, the descriptive tale of someone who was wounded by the pain and long-suffering of adultery and the desire to punish and take away all the good things because of it. That's oftentimes how we react, you know. In verse 13 it says, I will punish her for the days she burned incense to the bales. She decked herself with rings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me she forgot, declares the Lord. This tapestry that he's weaving and he's talking about the Lord's abandonment in, in this dynamic, it's, you're seeing it in two forms. You're seeing it in, in the dissension through, through Hosea and, and Gomer's relationship and how God's applying that to this relationship between him and Israel. And it's that tension that, that these relationships are living in. So as God uses Gomer and Hosea's relationship to depict this in a live model, it becomes more relevant and real to us because we know what resentment feels like. We know what abandonment feels like. We know what hurt and pain and woundedness feels like. And so through Hosea, we are experiencing God's long suffering in this relationship with Israel. And it's this dynamic of tension, of push and pull that God is feeling. And, and so in, verse, in chapter one, we saw that, that desire to pull away, right? But there's a change as we move forward. In verses 14 to 23, the conversation changed completely. You notice it was all about moving away and pulling away in the first 13 verses of chapter 2. But look at verse 14 and going on from there. There's a drastic change. All of a sudden, the desire is for restoration. And not just restoration, but redemption. To be made right and just. In verse 15, he wants to allure her and speak to her tenderly. Do you know that communication between two people in any conflict only works if you approach it tenderly? And so what God's saying is, I want to speak into Israel, but I want to do it tenderly. And what he's telling uh, Hosea to do is to go back and think about speaking tenderly to his wife. Oftentimes in adultery and brokenness, we're always trying to find ways to, to fill that, that void or cover up that fear or that defensiveness when it comes to being hurt and wounded. We want to put a wall up. We want to put a shield up. And it's hard. 
to respond appropriately. Oftentimes we respond with anger and resentment and frustration and the communication goes nowhere. And the Lord says, no, I want to approach her tenderly. In verses 19 through 20, I want to read those two verses to you again. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. Those two verses I just read. Do you know that every Orthodox Jewish male recites these two verses when he la- wraps the phylacteries around his arm. You see the things on the screens? Those little boxes hold scrolls. They hold verses that are relevant to, to them in their time of prayer. And it's these two scriptures, these two verses that they recite as they're putting these on their arm. One goes on the arm and has scriptures, and one goes on the head. You see, he has one on his head. And as they put these on, they recite these two verses. These two verses are not religious. They're done to remind them of their devotion to the Lord. These two verses are about relationship. I believe this represents the heart of God through his prophet Hosea. The relationship God wants with each of us is one of intimacy. He doesn't want a distant relationship, a religious relationship, where you attend Bible study and you go to church and all those things, as much as he wants an intimate relationship, and a relationship of knowing, a real relationship relational, involved. Think of it like two young people in love who can't ever get enough time together. You ever seen those young kids who've fallen in love, maybe engaged? You couldn't put a pry bar between them if you wanted to, right? And where, where are they at? Always together. Always together. You can't separate them, right? Imagine having that kind of relationship with the Lord. That your desire was to be in that kind of relationship. You know, Jesus should be our first love. I heard a story about a a gentleman who was courting a girl. And it's an incredible story. He goes to her one day as they're sitting together and he says, I love you. And she looks at him plain as day and says, thank you. Not the response he was expecting, but just matter of fact, plain as day, thank you. He goes to work the next day and somebody in his office calls him and says, hey, so-and-so's on the line and wants to talk to you. He picks up the phone and she says, I love you too. Taken aback, he pauses for a moment. She goes, I couldn't tell you yesterday because I had to go home and I had to have a conversation with Jesus because he is my first love. And I can't tell you I love you unless I've approved it with him first because he is my first love. That's powerful. Jesus should be our first love. We are betrothed. We're engaged. We don't want to be anywhere else other than that. 
with Jesus. Chapter 2 finishes out with verse 23. It says, I'll show, you my love, I'll show my love to the one I called not my loved one. I will say to those called not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. So through the second half of chapter 2, we see the promise and the hope of restoration. And that leads us into chapter 3. How many of you read Hosea? How many of you know how many verses are in chapter 3? It's a really short chapter. There's only five verses in chapter 3. So this shouldn't take you very long to read. Amen? Chapter 3, verse 1. The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. Though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will behave the same way towards you. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and do his blessings in the last days. You know, one commentator called this chapter the greatest chapter in the Bible because it portrays the greatest story in the Bible. It's the story of redemption. I love the word redemption. This word has its roots in slavery. From the Old and the New Testament, in the Greek language, to redeem, Hey, Brad, I didn't highlight that next slide. There's another slide right in there, that one, yeah. In the Greek language, to redeem is, I'll see if I can say this, so don't let me slaughter it, okay? <laughs> exagorazo, exagorazo, ex meaning out of, gorazo meaning marketplace. So the agora in the middle of that word is market. So Ex agorazo means out of the marketplace. So when we talk about redemption and the whole basis being on taking us out of slavery, it's being taken off the market, being taken out of the marketplace, right? And what does that mean for us? I want you to think about the price that Christ paid for our sin. Homer buys her for 15 shekels, for 15 pieces of silver and some ancient measurements of barley, right? Do you know Christ was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver? Do you know 30 pieces of the silver is the price someone had to pay for a slave who was gored by an ox? Because you lost the slave and its production? And I think that's pretty relevant when we think about being bought out of the marketplace, when we think of the price that was paid for Christ's crucifixion, and that price is payment for our sin. Think about that. We've been bought with a price. I am not my own. Another lives within me. Christ Jesus lives within me. I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. Another lives within me. Christ Jesus lives within me. So, we've been exagorizado. 
taken off the market. So in verse 1, God calls Hosea to love his wife Gomer again. Even though she is an adulteress, he calls him to love her just as God loves the Israelites who have loved other gods and their rituals and been unfaithful to him. So in the first three chapters, Hosea has experienced betrothal, betrayal, adultery, and now he's called to restore his wife. We're only in the first three chapters. In verse 2, he buys her back. He pays the 15 pieces of silver. It's hard to fathom that you could buy a human being for 15 pieces of silver. I struggle with that. You know, Joy and I are on the front lines of human trafficking and have been for several years because we can't believe that people traffic people. And that breaks my heart. That you can put a price on a human being. It breaks my heart. But that was the price to bring her back out of slavery. He's redeeming her, restoring her, just as God is prophesying Israel's redemption and restoration. In verse 3, he tells her that he is committed to her and that he wants her to be his and be committed to him so that she will no longer be a harlot, so she'll no longer be unfaithful to him. And her redemption includes restoring her position. By loving her. And that's what God's calling Israel to do. He wants to love them into restoration and redemption. Isn't that what God's saying to all of us? Still today? I want to love you. I want to redeem you. I want to restore you. We finish out chapter 3 with verses 4 and 5. It's such a short chapter, but so much emphasis on God's redeeming power and his prophetic nature. Notice that it says, Many days without king or prince, sacrifice or sacred stone, ephod or household gods. They will cease to worship other people, other rituals, and other gods, and eventually return to the Lord's blessing. Do you know since 70 AD, Israel has not had a king? And they won't have one until Jesus returns. Because right now in Israel, there's a kingless throne. And up in heaven, there's a king without a throne. But he's coming. Amen? So we step out of chapter 3 with a hope and a promise regarding Israel. A hope and a promise of redemption and restoration. And the same is for us, just as it is for Gomer. There's the hope and the promise of restoration, of redemption. I wonder if God's people are even able to fathom the pain and the long suffering of our Lord through the adulterous relationships with his people. How often do we today continue to call on the Lord in our time of need, only to fall back into worshiping other people, other idols, or even other sin? Hosea, through his obedience, was called to experience the long-suffering of an unfaithful spouse, just as God has experienced long-suffering with each of us and the nation of Israel, all because of God's desire to have an intimate relationship with us. Not something religious, not something surface, or even just checking the box type of relationships, but something real, something relational, something intimate. So I ask you, when was the last time 
you just sat down and had a long conversation with Jesus? When's the last time you had dinner with Jesus? Relationship is about knowing, sharing, confessing, accepting, and being intimate, fully involved. I wonder when, I wonder what we would say if we could sit down and just have dinner with Jesus. So that's your homework for this week. Set, a time, some, set aside some time to sit down, prepare, prepare yourself a meal, prepare a plate across the table from you, and invite Jesus to the table. Invite Jesus to have a conversation about where you are, what you're going through, and what he would have you do and where he would have you go. I stand at the door and knock. He who hears my voice and opens the door and lets me in, I will feast with him and he with me. It's an invitation for relationship. It's an invitation for intimacy. To be known, to be loved. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're so grateful that you seek us out. That even in through the long suffering and the turmoil of your pain in relationship with, with your people and us as your children, how we come to you and we turn away from you and all those things, that you continue to draw us to you. Your desires for intimacy, Father, for relationship with us that is far beyond any we could have with any other human being. So we want to invite you in to speak to our hearts, to reveal yourself to us and us to you in a way that just continues to bless us. Father, we just thank you for our time together this morning. Thank you for revealing yourself through Hosea and his relationship with Gomer. And thanks for just loving us and for walking beside us and meeting us right where we're at. We give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise. God's children said, Amen. You may be seated. I want to thank you all for joining us online today. As we get prepared to move into our time of open worship, we want to just wish you a blessing and a happy week as well. Um, drop in the comments if there's anything we can pray for you. Uh, if you want to drop us a, a phone message or a PM message or anything like that, uh, feel free to do so. We'd be honored to pray for you and to walk beside you as you journey throughout your week. Thanks for joining us this morning. <laughs>